Hey, it's Luke without a darts. Today we are going to build Herja, or Herja, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, this blaster is a lot of fun. It is a really cool side along blaster. It's got three different options for rail mounts. You can mount to a variety of blasters. It's full auto. It's got buttons on both sides, as well as the option to trigger it remotely with a trigger that looks like this guy or any trigger you dream up for that matter. Um, so today we're gonna show you how to build this and uh, let's get going. Before we get started, it is really important to mention this blaster uses a lithium polymer battery, also known as a LiPo battery. There are a lot of care and use guidelines you absolutely need to follow to both use these safely and to not destroy your battery. One of those being you do need to use a LiPo alarm to ensure that you don't drain the battery too far. This is not a complete list. You do need to look at the entire page on our website. It's up at the top banner. So give that a read and make sure that you're comfortable with all of this before you get going in using the building this blaster. Let's start by talking about all the parts that are included in the kit. As I mentioned, you'll get everything you need but the battery, charger, and alarm. Uh, you'll get all of the different 3D parts. There are three different colors you get to choose when selecting the blaster. It comes with the worker micro flywheels, You'll also get a pair of Loki motors, our high RPM motors that we specifically got made for this blaster. You'll see your, there are two switches included. One is for the external trigger, which looks like this when assembled. The other is for the standard internal trigger. You've got your N20 pusher motor available in a variety of RPMs. You'll receive two XT30 sets. One is for your main battery connector. The other is for your external switch. And then you'll receive wire and heat shrink for the connections. You'll also receive a bag of all of the various hardware, a couple motor spacers, and importantly, your cage screws, which will be bagged separately like this. Tools required for this build are pretty standard. You are going to need a soldering iron, um, I've got my Weller Digital here, which I like very much. It's got lots of thermal capacity for the price point, and it's really easy to set, and it heats up quickly. You're going to want helping hands. Uh, I find them very useful, but for this build especially, you are going to want them. You're going to need solder. I always use lead-free. This is the solder we sell on the website. You may want a pair of snips in case there's any trim up to do, though it shouldn't strictly be required. You'll want uh, wire strippers of some sort, or you can get by with just an X-Acto knife and or hobby blade. Hobby blade is also handy if you need to clean up any little bits and pieces there as you go along. You will need both an M2.5 and an M2, that's a 2.5 millimeter and two millimeter hex driver, also known as an Allen key, a number zero screwdriver, You'll also need Loctite. We recommend the blue variety because it's easier to remove later if you ever needed to swap something. You may want a little lubricant for the triggers, though it's not strictly required. You may want a pair of pliers. Optionally, you're gonna want a heat gun just for hitting heat shrink, but you can always use a lighter or some other heat source, including your soldering iron to do that. Lastly, safety first, you'll definitely want a pair of eye protection for when soldering. Let's get going. There are five slots on the cage itself. Each of these is for a square nut, and each of these helps lock the whole blaster together. So you're gonna sort of preset each of the nuts. Make sure you're using the square nuts and not the hex nuts, and it should be five of them total. And boy, is it cold in the warehouse today. Next, you're just gonna push these flush. Start by getting them all flush. Then you're gonna to wanna to use either a screwdriver or just the tip of a pliers to push them all the way down. Be careful you don't poke yourself while doing so. And as you go through, you wanna check and make sure that you can see the thread that they are lined up. And you can see that is just lined up. I probably could go a little further, so I'm gonna poke, poke that a bit more. And if any of those don't seem like they're perfectly lined up, you can kind of get your Allen key in there and just work gently. Don't go too hard on it. You don't want to break anything, of course, but you want those holes to line up. If they're slightly loose, that's fine. The tolerances will vary because all of these are printed at different orientations. And when you've got 30 or so colors of filament, there's going to be small variations here and there. But at the end, they should look like that and should all be installed. Next, we're going to take our center core here and we're going to take two 
of the square nuts and install them on the two sides right here and right here. Now, if you find that these are uh, too loose or on the looser side for you, tolerances will vary print to print a little bit. Uh, you can use a little bit of CA glue or uh, cyanacrylate, super glue that is, to hold them in place. And I'm going to go ahead and do that on this one side just to show you. So if you do decide you want to glue them in, um, we recommend a real thick cyanacrylate. You're going to just put about a single drop on the top here. You'd really be sparing on it. You don't need much. And then if you have it, you can use uh, the Instaset. And Greg's great tip here is to actually use the dropper just to get a single drop in there instead of using the spray because this is such a small area. And that'll set it up nearly instantly. Now we're going to install our detents. You will need some super glue or cyanacrylate for this. Before you install these, you do have the option of putting in one or two. Two will be a much firmer pull on the mag, while one will be a much lighter pull. Just like Luchadora, you have the option on how much tension you're going to put in. Personally, I like it to be real rock solid, so I put in two. And the easiest way to do this is to kind of get a feel for how these line up. There's, there are two holes in there. You're just going to simply push them in place. I find it easiest to put basically a drop on one of the corners here like this. You don't want to get it into that hole, ideally and then you're going to kind of push it in place. Just like that. Set it with the pliers and then push it in with your finger. It's generally the easiest. You don't need to go too overboard on the glue, but you do need to use enough to hold it tightly. You don't want those popping out. And then I usually like to activate them a couple times as they're drying, just in the event that you perhaps get too much in there. So, you know, for 20, 30 seconds after you put in the quick, the, uh, thicker super glue, make sure that these are still good. Next, we're going to take our Loki motors and we're going to actually install them into the flywheel cage. Now, if you're following the wiring diagram, the orientation does matter. So you're going to want to match exactly as I've got shown here on camera, just like that. And then holding those in place, or setting it upside down, we're going to put our four cage screws in. Now you are going to want to lock tight these in, especially with the high RPM motors. You're going to need this blue thread locker. Just a little drop on each. Nice and snug, but not over tight. Repeat for the other three screws. Once your screws are installed, they should be perfectly flush. If you have any extra of the Loctite, just wipe it away. Uh, these are PLA cages, so they won't react with the Loctite itself. Something to keep in mind if you're ever printing polycarbonate. Now we're going to take our wheels. They do not have an orientation. They're both the same, both directions, and you can push these all the way down. Just try to push them on nice and straight, and you want to make sure you're supporting the back of the motor while you're doing this. And they should be nice and snug. Alternatively, you can set the motors on something like this to push down on a surface. Just again, make sure you're supporting the tabs. So I'm going to kind of set it on top of here. Make sure you're not damaging those tabs while shoving down these motors onto the shaft. Alignment should look like this. You want to be centered on that hole and the two flywheels themselves should be even with each other. If you're having difficulties getting them on, they are supposed to be a very snug fit. Uh, you can set this on the edge of a table, put a towel down first, but pretend this is the edge of a table, and then you can push down on the back here with uh, a screwdriver or, or like I like to do, the side of this just to get a little bit more leverage and use more of your arm strength and back strength rather than your finger strength pinching. So first we're going to install our master on off switch, and you're going to start by taking a piece of your red wire and stripping off a little bit of the end. You can either pre-tin that if you prefer for connection, or you can put it in directly. I'm going to actually solder it into this terminal. I actually have more wire exposed there than I want, so I am going to snip that a little bit shorter. Safety first. Now we can go ahead and drop this switch and just click it into place on the actual front plate. 
and it will sit nicely recessed right in there. It should look just like that. Next, we're gonna take our pusher wheel and one of your shortest screws. This is M3 by five millimeter screw. And we're just gonna partially thread this in and then we're going to put a little super glue in this guy as well. So I'll thread it most of the way. Then I'm gonna give it a little drop of, of CA glue just to ensure that this never comes loose. And drive that all the way in. To prep this top part, there is a sacrificial layer right here where you just need to ream out the hole. Not much to it. You can do it with an X-Acto knife. You can do it with a drill. You can even get a screwdriver in there to just clean up that hole. Now we're gonna go ahead and install our pusher motor. The orientation doesn't matter. You're just going to drop this in place. And we're going to take our actual pusher wheel and we're gonna line up that flat slot with the flat side of the D-shaft here. And you wanna push this just until it's flush. Depending on the variant you've got, this shouldn't be able to go past, but you want that to be nice and smooth there so it's not interfering with our pusher. Future Luke here, because we missed a step, but you'll see it in order because we were careful on and watching our edit. After you've put in this screw here, you're gonna take one of your five millimeter, that's the shortest M3 screws, and you're gonna thread it all the way into here. Push it down to the base. Now this one does just thread into plastic, but it's just there to hold that uh, D-shaft for the motor in place a little bit more snugly. Now, funny enough, it's probably not totally necessary, but it's one of those things that uh, Tark thought would be more reliable overall. And you don't want to over tighten this since it is just going into plastic. So when you feel a lot of resistance, you can stop. And there you're good to go. Now you're going to take your pusher and drop it in the slot like so. Put it somewhere in the middle and we're going to line up this peg with that slot there ensuring that they are connected by doing that. After that, you can pull it all the way to the back, hold the whole assembly together, and you're gonna put two 10 millimeter screws in those two holes. Those are the medium sized screws or smallish medium 10 millimeters long. After you've installed those two, you're gonna do one more same size 10 mil here in the back. Now you can just set your cage in place. It should slide in smoothly there. Now that we've got our cage in, we are gonna drop in our front plate and this is just for determining the length of the wiring to go to the battery. So you can hold that in place there. You're gonna bring this around the motor and through, through this little slot, we're gonna go up over the top here, back down and then we're gonna push it to the bottom of this cavity here, which is the battery compartment, just so it's touching in the bottom. And then you're gonna to wanna to cut it off at about an inch sticking out of here. So that should do, and that'll be connecting to our XT, XT30 connector. Now we're going to wire in our N20 motor, and we've got a double wire here. You can actually take this all apart. We're just going to use these as single individual wires, so you can split them apart strip just a tiny bit of either end. The N20 motor is very low current, so it does not take much wire to deliver the capacity it needs. I'm gonna start by taking the black wire and I'm gonna insert that here. I'd recommend doing the insertion method and running through this wire channel rather than trying to uh, pre-tin these because it's a matter of the space available that is inside there and then go ahead and solder both in place. These motors are somewhat more delicate as far as the amount of heat required, so they should solder up very quickly. And you wanna make sure you don't have too much excess solder sticking out of the top. That should be just fine there. Next, we're gonna fit our switch plate in. So we're gonna start by just dry fitting everything to make sure it works. You'll see this is a cutout of the N20. So we'll push that down in place. Wanna make sure you clear the wires on the sides. If you have any issues fitting that, just do sand or, or cut away with an X-Acto knife, but it should fit pretty easily. Then we'll take our switch, and we won't drop it in there. <laughs> we'll drop the switch right in place. Like so. Now we'll take our switch with the flat side is gonna to go towards the button, our switch uh, press device for lack of a better term. 
And then we've got our two actuators, our actual buttons that uh, should be pretty self-explanatory. They only fit on one side correctly. Once you've got that in, make sure you've got this wire cleared and you wanna just double check that both sides do in fact actuate the switch without sticking or binding. If you happen to find any binding or sticking, uh, you'll just simply need to trim or sand to make sure they work, but these work right out of the, out of the gate, so you shouldn't need anything there. Now you're gonna go ahead and take your top plate for that switch, and you're gonna drop that in place. Then you're gonna take your two 20 millimeter screws. Uh, they're about the width of my thumb, and you're gonna drive them all the way in, and that holds the whole plate together and the plate to the body itself. If you find that after installing this plate, you have any issues with your switches, just back off the screws a turn or so, and that'll free up and loosen those to make sure that they're activating fine. Now we're gonna solder up our motors. I've already stripped a tiny bit off of this red piece of wire. You can solder in the assembly here, but if you aren't as confident with um, splattering solder or, or melting your parts, I might recommend taking it out and doing it outside of the, outside of the blaster itself. First piece of wire is gonna go across like this, so I'm just going to mark where I want to strip that second bit. You don't actually have to mark yourself, it's just a matter of being able to do it. Go ahead and put these motor pads on here. These are just to help you avoid connecting any solder to the body of the motors. This is optional, but uh, we even use them in-house just because it's quicker and it's very convenient. It allows you to work I'd almost say a little more sloppily, for lack of a better descriptor. And repeat for the second terminal. Now we'll do the reverse for the black wire. And solder in that last terminal. Now we can drop our cage back into the assembly and take our M3 by 10, that's the medium to smallish size, and screw in our front plate. Next, we're gonna take our two countersunk screws, which are still M3 thread, but they've used a smaller driver, a two millimeter driver. So you're gonna put one on either side, locking your cage in place. Now we're gonna run this wire just to get a fit feel for it. It's gonna come up through here, through this channel, and this is just temporary. It's gonna end up connecting to the common there and going down to our XT60, XT30 connector, excuse me, which is in the base here. So make sure that you've got enough room to connect to that connector, and then you can go ahead and cut that. It's probably, if you're pulling from the common here, probably three inches past the blaster itself. So we'll go ahead and snip that. And then we're going to come back with this extra piece and we're gonna attach it to our master on off here. So we're gonna strip just a tiny bit of the end. Go ahead and insert that there. And then we'll solder that guy in place. It's worth noting, you wanna make sure these two terminals are of course not touching in any way. That's very important. Now we're gonna take this wire and we're gonna run it up and around the motors here. We're gonna run it into this little channel lock here. There's a little bit of a crevice. You may have to work to get it around your other wire. So it should go up in, into that channel there. And then it's gonna go over the top of this and through this channel. And you can go ahead and push it to the base of this channel because there will be two wires going through that channel at the end of the day. Now that will be going down to your XT60, so you can leave that for the moment being. Then we're gonna take our wire, this is coming from our motor terminals. We're gonna follow that same wire path. And this is going to connect to our common here first. So when you get it here, you can uh, mark it or just strip it however you prefer. But for visual, I will mark it. And we'll go ahead and strip that section. Since we're going on over a nice switch terminal, I like to just split this wire open a little bit and we'll put it right onto the terminal. 
And then for now, we'll just shove that down into the bottom so we can solder in place. And then go ahead and solder onto that common switch. Again, this is from your flywheel. Now we're gonna take our black pusher wire here and run it back over the same wire path. And this is going to connect to this terminal right here. That's where the pusher gets its negative from. So we'll go ahead and strip a little bit of that. You'll definitely want helping hands for this portion. And this is definitely a scenario where I think pre-tinning is best because you're connecting this wire to something that's already got solder on it. Now we're gonna run these two power leads to our main XT30 connector coming from our battery. So first we'll take the black one here. We're gonna run it through this wire path, up over there, again through this one, and we'll do the same with the red. You can help to use a little Allen key to push this down into the wire trap there. The wire traps aren't strictly necessary, but they do make it easier to get the blaster together at the end. Now I've got these two leads here. We're gonna take them and cut them to the same length. Then I'm gonna cut a small piece of heat shrink for each connector. Each wire rather, slide that on. We'll prep our XT30 connector. I'm going to use, I'm gonna make sure you're using the male side. That is the side with the prongs. I like to solder them together where the connectors are touching. Gives you a little bit more security. We'll go ahead and strip both of these wires. Give them both a little twist. Flat side is always positive. And a note there, don't, uh, tin, don't pre tin the connectors because this is the maximum wire size that you're gonna be able to fit inside an XT30 connector. And we'll go ahead and flux that in until we've filled up the entire cup. And then we'll repeat for the negative side. After that, you can go ahead and slide your heat shrink down and you can either use the side of an iron like this to melt them in place, or since I've got it available, heat gun. Now you can take the other half off and your battery connector will essentially sit like that because this is your battery compartment. Next, we're gonna take our N20 wire and we're gonna attach it to our common along with that other wire. So leave yourself enough room to work. Strip off a little bit of the end. and attach that to that other bundle. You can choose to pretend this if you like. There are two wires coming from up front. The one that is attached to your front switch is going to go to your normally open, which is your middle terminal here. So just like the other one we did, you can, you can either mark it Do a center strip, like so. And then I'm gonna go ahead and split the wire, put it over that terminal, just to make it easier, to both easier to solder and it makes it a little more secure, having that physical connection. So hopefully you can see where I'm working. It's that middle terminal we're gonna solder. It's a little tricky to get this on camera. I will show you as soon as I've got it soldered. And now we've got that soldered in place. In this wiring setup, the normally closed NC here terminal will not be used. Uh, the reason for that, as much as we'd like to have motor braking, there's no way to have an external switch with motor braking and the internal. So the option to do both, both this switch or the external clicking switch um, without and do the motor braking. We would need a relay or uh, some MOSFETs for that. So because of that, we're 
omitting that, and we found that it's plenty reliable without the motor braking. Now, lastly, we've got these two wires here. These are gonna be wired to an XT30 female, and this is our external switch connection. So we're gonna clip this and solder it just like we did the other terminal, except this time we're soldering the opposite end. So again, female looks like this. And polarity here does not matter because it's simply an on off switch. Go ahead and strip both sides, just like we did before. You wanna to cut two more small pieces of heat shrink and put them on either end. Now, while polarity doesn't matter, I'd recommend lining up your XT30 like this. And the wires are gonna come out at a right angle when they're installed down in here. So you are gonna to wanna to make sure that you have enough flexibility to give a bend. So you could do this while soldering if you want, have them kind of come out at an angle or you can bend them afterwards, but just know that you're gonna to have to do that. So we're gonna kind of pre-bend our connector like that. And then we're gonna work it down into the hole so it comes out at the bottom. Now we have made these connectors opposites of each other so you can't accidentally plug your battery into your switch and you can't plug your switch into your, into the, uh, what should be the power port. So in the bottom here, there is a little notch, a little line here. That's basically going to interface with the front of this connector. So you're gonna kind of put it as far back that direction as you can, and then in theory slide in place. When you get that in place, should look about like that. And then you've got this plate that will go down on the top with a single screw. So this plate slides into a little slot at the bottom of this channel. So hopefully you can see how that's sliding into place. I'll try to line it up so you can see the hole. There we go. And then you're gonna take one of your smallest M3 by six screws here and thread that in place. We put as few screws going into plastic as physically possible on this blaster. The majority of the screws go into brass inserts, but this is one exception. There we go. Check that your wires are all tucked through their channels and that everything looks like it can close. And now we are ready for final assembly. We'll continue with the front plate. Mm -hmm. You wanna just double check that this should seat firmly here and the seam should be tight. Now we'll take four more of our countersunk 10 millimeter M3 screws and drive them in again with the two millimeter hex driver. Now we're gonna build our Picatinny rail. Now you've got a couple options here, uh, but the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is to actually assemble them. They are conveniently labeled, so if you've got multiples, you'll have a good idea. The first thing you wanna do is set in your hex nuts and these are intended to be kind of a firm fit so they don't fall out after you're done installing them. So we're kind of press, press those in like so. One pro tip here from my team as far as installation on these square nuts, or a hex nuts rather, is to take a hex nut and attach it just slightly, thread it a few, th few threads in, and then use that to push it into place, then unthread. I'll repeat that one more time. This just lets you get that hex nut in there as quickly as possible and nice and straight, so it's really easy to install. And then we're gonna run our two longest screws, should be very obvious. And we will connect those. And you can just thread these loosely unless you're putting them actually on the rail. Just want them enough to catch that nut on the other side before we actually put it on the blaster. 
Now I'm going to set up my blaster with this on the right side. So let's say I was going to toss this on, let's assume like a Nexus. Um, I wouldn't, I'm right-handed, so I prime with my left. I wouldn't want this on the left side because it would be in the way. You could also install it under or on the um, left side of the blaster, which is the right side of this blaster. So I'm going to install this in here. We're just going to take our two countersunk and M3 by 10 screws and install that into our brass inserts. I didn't mention this in the beginning, but it should be obvious. We install the brass inserts here because we want to make sure that they are properly installed and um, that nobody has any problems with them. It's an easier thing to do with the proper tool. It would also be easier to install this rail if I used the right driver. <laughs> And I've chosen to, nope. I would recommend flipping this around. We're gonna do that again. So you're gonna want it to match the level, you know, Herja is this way, Picatinny that way. That way when you want to actually tighten your screws on a blaster, you're grabbing from the top. Your mileage may vary depending on how you're setting this up, of course. There's no reason you can't fire this blaster sideways, upside down, mounted on a shoulder. We're really excited to see what people do with them. Now we're going to install our top Picatinny rail, and that's just using two standard M3x10. Now you've got two positions you can choose here. I'm going to go with a little bit farther forward. So we're going to drop those in, line them up with our two brass inserts, and screw into place. It's also worth noting this rail, just like this mount, can go on any of the three positions. So you've got options as far as how that can connect to the blaster and how you can connect additional blasters to this one. And uh, that just makes me think, how many of these can we put together, mounted together? Oh boy, we're gonna have a fun video with that one. Now we're gonna build our external switch. This is of course optional. And you could really use any switch you want because all you're doing to activate this blaster externally is hitting connecting these two points together. So if you take, we're gonna to solder to the switch, we're gonna of course use the common and the normally open, which are these two terminals here. And I'm gonna take a piece of this wire, we're gonna split it, strip a little bit off each end. Now we're going to drop that switch into place here, like, like so, and route those wires out. And drop in our actual button. Should be able to click and hear that. And then you've got your top cover, which just snaps in place. Now this can be glued or attached to anywhere on a blaster you want, or you can use a piece of double stick tape, or you can make up your own switch or integrate your own switch to your own blaster. You really could use any momentary switch. Uh, I'm kind of picturing taking some of those round momentary switches that we sell in the shop and using them integrated to an existing blaster and then running this connector to another connector. And then the last step here for the external switch is just to connect our male end to this end here. And this is the same as we did for all the XT30 connectors on the blaster. Like before, the polarity here does not matter. And there we have our final assembled switch. And that's basically it. So the last thing to do is to actually take a battery, plug in our LiPo alarm. If you plug it in backwards, try again. Go ahead and actually plug our battery in. Test one. Turn our on and off switch to on. Check that you can see your pusher moving. And then we can go ahead and actually tuck your battery away. We recommend the 450 milliamp pack for this, bat, this blaster because it does fit the best. You can fit a 550, but I'm warning you, it is a tight, uh, more of a negotiation to get it in place. It has to sit right here, 
with the alarm down the center. And then all these wires need to go down through the middle, like so. And this will slide on that way. One note on the battery door, if you have any problems with the switches binding, this little layer right here may need just a slight trim depending on how the support layer actually printed. Should only take you a second or so, but in case we don't catch it in prep, that's something to be aware of. And once you've got that on, you'll go ahead and take one of your, your very last 10 millimeter M3 screw and screw that in place. And you can test your two switches, make sure they're not binding. Now we've got our battery in and we are ready to fire. So I've got a Tachi magazine here and uh, now I've got a Tomahawk. <laughs> One thing to be, to be forewarned about is if you set this flat surface on a table, your blaster will fire, but I can activate either side. And as previously mentioned, I can plug in our on off switch and that will also activate it. And now I'm out of darts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this build guide was helpful. We're trying to work to keep these as pre, uh, concise and uh, precise as possible to make them easier for all of you to build your own blasters. Tarek had a lot of fun putting this one together and I really enjoyed the process. A huge shout out to my buddy Mo who did the cosmetic styling of the blaster. I think he did a really nice job and it was nice working with an artist to get that sort of third opinion on the overall piece. Until next time, I'm out of darts.